Okay, so uh, let me start with the word of prayer before we get into this lesson study. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful and thankful to be able to gather here uh, in fellowship, Father, and study your word. Uh, we just ask this morning that your Holy Spirit will be present amongst us and dwell in our hearts and our minds that uh, we might be humbled and be able to receive the message. We pray also that this message, that the focal point be on our loving Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and ask these things in his name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start with, yes. You want me to ring the bell at 10 till or 5 till? If I ring it at 5 till, that gives you 5 minutes to wrap things up. If I ring okay. at 10 till, then that gives you 10 minutes to wrap things up. Okay. Tell me what you want. Uh, that's a tough one. So if I get it at 5 till, is that the last bell? Well, or it's still the first saying, bell yeah, because we still have till 10. How much warning do you want? Right, right. Um, Let's go to five. I'll try okay. and make sure I get it in that time. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to start with the memory text as usual. The lesson study for this week is, the, the title is, More Lessons from the Master Teacher. And the memory text is found in Mark 10, 52. And uh, it comes from the New King James Version. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And he immediately received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. So we're going to see a little bit more uh, in, uh, I think, Thursday's lesson study on this. Uh, I think most of us are familiar with Bartimaeus, uh, the blind man that Jesus healed. Uh, so moving forward, I'm just going to briefly go through Sundays just, just to mention a few things in it. Um, and it starts out with uh, mentioning uh, who among us has ever been ashamed of himself or herself. I know I've been there for sure. Um, so interestingly enough, I like the thing that follows it right after that says, uh, it says, uh, who among us hasn't done things that pains us to think about and that we would recoil in horror at the thought of others knowing, uh, kind of interesting. The reason I said it's interesting is because for me, and this is just me personally, you know, um, when I think about things that I might be doing that aren't in line with who I am as a Christian, uh, you know, oftentimes people try to hide themselves from others. You can't hide from God. And for me, ultimately, the only one that I really have to worry about seeing what I'm doing is not really other people, but God. So just wanted to mention that. Um, so it goes on just to tell us about Adam and Eve, you know, when they sinned, uh, Jacob, when he tricked his father. Um, it mentions a few others, uh, the woman caught in adultery. And uh, so uh, towards the bottom, I'm just going to read it. It says, of course, that's one reason the gospel is universal and Christ's death was for all humanity. So in other words, you know, these people, you know, oftentimes we think of everybody in the Bible. I mean, at times that they are just really these holy people. But yet, the Bible always points out to us their downfalls and at times their sins. Um, because there was only very few people in the Bible to begin with anyway that were very little in their sins, right? I mean, if we think of David, he wouldn't be one of those people, would he? As far as the sins that he had done in his life. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, uh, I was talking about this this morning. Uh, I had a, my brother-in-law had called me and mentioned uh, an issue that had happened with him concerning his relationship with my sister. And, uh, he, you know, he didn't want this issue coming up. He, he said, you know, you already forgave me of what I've done. Why do you keep bringing it up? And so I kind of always go to David in that case. I said, you know, God forgives us, but yet when we sin, sometimes we don't realize the consequences of that sin and Sometimes that sin, in most cases, leaves a permanent scar. I said, this is something that you'll probably have to deal with for the rest of your relationship. You know, just like David dealt with those sins his whole life. And so that's the danger of, of sin that we sometimes underestimate. We don't really think of the consequences when we do it. Um, so surely one thing unites us, our general sinfulness, Hence, true Christian education must be about pointing us to the only solution for our rather dismal state. So, in every case, you see 
here's the sin, but then here we have the answer to the sin, which is Jesus Christ, right? And I, and I love that about the lesson study, of course, meaning the whole Bible showing us that. Um, any questions? Anybody have any comments so far before I move on? I'm going to try to get to Friday. We'll see what happens. Okay, so Sunday's lesson is instead of hiding. Let's take a look at Genesis 3 just briefly. We don't, we're not, we don't have time to go through it or read it. I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with it because it is Genesis. Um, so Genesis, Genesis 3, 1 through 11. Uh, it's telling us about the fall, of course, Adam and Eve and what happened in the garden. Um, I'm just going to read the first, uh, the, the uh, first one. <laughs> it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, and pay close attention here, because I'm going to call somebody out on this and see if I can get some uh, feedback. Uh, and he, he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the tree, or the fruit of the trees, of the garden. Out of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it. Did you guys catch any correction in there that where she was correcting Satan on something? What, what, what was it? Did anybody see? There's two things, actually. Remember, Satan comes to her, and he's deceiving her. And he's not truthful. He mixes a little bit of truth with a big lie, right? So what's that? What's what's the first one that he that he lied about? He says, "God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden." Is that true? God didn't say that. He said you can eat of all of the trees, right? But you look, and then you see she's pretty much correct in verse three because she says, "Out." of the fruit of the trees, or excuse me, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it. But here's the other thing. It wasn't Satan. I mean, I'm correcting myself here. She says, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Now here she's misquoting God. Did God say that if you touch it? He didn't say that, did he? So it's kind of interesting how these things you know, first we got Satan misquoting God, and then you have Eve misquoting God. Um, so moving forward, uh, let's see. Uh, of course, we know that she was told that as soon as she eats it, her eyes would be open and she would be knowing good from evil. You know, that's a lesson study within itself, I think, because there's a lot to that. You know, what, what, what does it really mean? I'm just putting a big question out there. I'm not asking for any responses, but... You know, what does that really mean, that your eyes will be open and you'll be knowing good from evil? I mean, we'll find that throughout the Bible. You can find scriptures to line up with that. And like I said, it's another study in itself. But let's just move forward in this lesson study. Um, so we know that uh, the fruit, you know, I love the fallacies that we have in modern culture when people say things about the Bible that aren't really either in the Bible or they're misquoting the Bible which there's so many, um, and one of them is, you know, of course, everybody thinks that that fruit was an apple, right? We know <laughs> people that hated apples, yeah. Um, so we know that it was basically just a fruit. We don't know what kind it was, but we know that the Bible says that it was pleasing to the eye. So there you have the first problem is that we have the the eyes, you know, we're going to see later on the story of Bartimaeus, you know, where... His eyes were open physically and spiritually. But here we have, uh, you know, so she sees the fruit that's desirable. And then, of course, we know what happens after that. And then immediately after they sin, after they sin, they go and hide. They hide themselves from God. And, of course, God asks a question when he comes into the garden. Uh, let me let me get to that one there. Um let me go to six anyway. It says, uh, I was just talking about that. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise. So you have two things now, you know, her eyes being open and having this desire. And the Bible says that, uh, I'm, I'm, if somebody can help me out with that, the scripture that says uh, uh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, right? Here you have both of those right there, right? Lust of the eyes. 
you know, she saw the fruit, and the pride of life, wanting to be, to make one wise. Um, and then it says, uh, she ate, she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Interestingly enough, she was tricked. He wasn't tricked. He did it willingly, didn't he? Right? Um, then the eyes of them were Op- the, of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. i um, just going to move over to the part we're getting at now. It says in verse 9, Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. So here we have, again, like I mentioned, that Sin comes in, and next thing you know, man is hiding from God. You know, we had that oneness, and now we have that separation. Uh, so why did God ask him? This is the question for the lesson. So I just want to get some responses. Um, I have my own answers, of course, but I want to hear what you guys have to say. So, number one, we know God knows everything. God knew where Adam was. So why did he ask him this question? Why did he ask him, you know, where are you? When he was, came to the garden. Why is he asking Adam, knowing he knows where Adam is, why is he asking him, where are you? Any comments? Yeah, go ahead, brother. Uh, we need sound on the mic, brother. Um, it's coming. Hello? There you, you, got, go. you got sound? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting about that text because uh, why God would ask that question, but uh, it's really a reflection of them thinking, you know, why am I hiding? And they gave an honest answer. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to me. I always found that interesting. The first thing out of Adam's mouth, assume it was Adam and so forth, was that we were naked. And, you know, I go back to the story in Genesis where it says they were naked and they were not ashamed. And so sometimes what God makes good, the devil makes bad. And so forth. And God said, who told you you were naked? It wasn't an issue before. Why is it now? Mm-hmm. And, and, and also, number two was that they were afraid. And so forth. And so I think it gives the opportunity for them both to think, what have you done? Mm-hmm. Think through that. They gave an honest answer, uh, and so I think, uh, and so, but that's what God was trying to concentrate on. I don't think they understood the repercussions of their actions. They knew that they would die, but what would that mean to them? You know, death was, I mean, how would you define that for them? Uh, and so forth. So they really didn't understand, like we don't, at times, the repercussions, as you mentioned earlier, of mm-hmm. our sin. So I think that's that's the primary reason that uh, you know, so others may have a different opinion on that. But uh, okay, anyway. yeah, yeah, I like your answer. Thanks. Did you have a comment, sister? Thank you. Um, I, I was just going to add that it, it was a way to start dialogue. I mean, they were planning to hide, and if if he didn't say something, they probably would have sat there and not done anything. It was a way of you know, I mean, it almost says you know, I know where you are. Let's start talking. This this hiding is ridiculous. Yeah, part of the reason for, for their hiding, too, though, we got to remember, uh, Ellen G. White tells us that before sin, Adam and Eve's bodies were covered in light. But as soon as sin came into the picture, that light disappeared. That's why they knew they were naked. On that, there was a man by who uh, wrote a book, and it's kind of humorous. It was in bright red, came out in the 1960s, and I think Wichaby, uh, Professor Wichaby. Anybody remember him? And he wrote a book about sex in his book. And so uh, it was unheard of to have that kind of a book in our book and Bible house. But he felt it was necessary, as did the General Conference, that it be printed. It covered a lot of items. So a question came up in one of his lectures and said, well, he said, how, uh, and then Adam Eve really weren't naked, were they? He said, nobody said that the light wasn't transparent. <laughs> so just a thought. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I mean, when we see light, especially when it's right in our face, it tends to blind us, right? Or, you know, I mean, we see light, and if there's something, that light kind of tends to glare. So whatever the case, Ellen G. White does tell us that they were covered in light. 
Um, okay, so Romans 5, 11 through 19, uh, Paul is showing us, and you can turn there, we don't, we're not, we don't have time to read the whole, uh, all of the scriptures there, but it, I'm going to give you some of the examples, and I'll give you guys a chance to read also, but um, Paul ends up linking Adam, the first Adam, and Jesus to being the second Adam. And basically, everything that Adam had done, let's take a look at some of those. Um, I'm just going to read 11, and, and I'll pick a few more after that. It says, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So we have sin, and the answer to the sin problem was already in the garden when they had sinned. Uh, when she had told, when God had told Eve that the seed would come through her. So that was the answer to the solution, or the solution to the problem, I mean, of the sin problem was the Savior coming through, through them eventually, of course. Um, so Paul is showing us some of the things, and I'm just going to read a little bit here. It says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all man because all sinned, 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. We all understand that so far, right? Okay, so if, if there's no law, then how can you show what sin is? So there wouldn't be any sin. Uh, I, you know, I always relate the law to our laws. You know, it, it's a good reference like, uh, you know, if there's no speed limit, you can drive however fast you want legally, right? But as soon as there's a speed limit, now you're accountable if you're going above that speed limit. Um, so what he always says, he says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So he's, he's telling us that basically everything that Adam had done, Jesus comes to undo. Okay. I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with that also. Hopefully, if not, then we're going to learn something new. Uh, I'm going to read the bottom here. It says, one could argue the plan of salvation is God's response to Adam and Eve's answer. They were hiding from God in the shame and the guilt of their sin, and God came to rescue them. In our own ways, we too have done the same thing, and Jesus has come to rescue us. Hence the question, where are you, could be asked of all of us as well, that is, where are you in your sin and guilt in your relationship with Jesus and what has he done to rescue you from it? So that's how they're relating the question of where are you? Where are you in your sin? Where are you in your relationship with God, with Christ? Um, okay, any comments? Because I'm going to move forward to the next lesson. So. Okay. Um, Monday's lesson is on the run. And... Uh, we're going to look at Genesis 28. Again, we've got a lot of scriptures there. Maybe I can get somebody to read one of them or two of them. Uh, and the question is asked, what is the context of this story, and what does it teach us about God's grace for those who, in a sense, are on the run from their sins? So the story we're all familiar with is the story of Jacob when he's running from his brother, and he's in the wilderness, um, and... Verse 10 says, Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took, this, he took one of the stones of that place and put his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So, interesting picture. Uh, what's kind of funny about it is Jacob laying his head on a rock, right? Uh, kind of think oh, about yeah. that for a minute. You know, everything is Jesus Christ, right, in the Bible. Everything points to him. So here we have a rock. You know, he's troubled because his brother's chasing him to kill him. Or so he thinks. So he lays his head on the rock, right? And he gets his rest. I don't know how much rest you can get laying on a rock, but that's, that's the uh, example there would be Jesus. Um, 
And so he sees this ladder. We've heard this story many times, right? Jacob's ladder. The angels up and back. Somebody want to tell me what that's an example of or what that represents? Paul gives us the answer if we don't know. Takers. Come on, really? We know we know what that is, right? That uh, was a vision of God's connection yeah. with humanity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The angels doing the work of God, coming down to earth, going back and forth, you know, possibly ships. But let's see what um let's see what Paul has to say about it. And and if there's any comments, just feel free, raise your hand, speak up, we'll we'll get a mic to you. Um give me a second, because I gotta just uh, let me just read from one of Ellen G. White's comments, and it's found in um, Acts of the Apostles. So if we've read Acts of the Apostles, we've, can't, we've come across this. Uh, she says, and I believe she's quoting Paul, she says, This man of faith, Paul, beholds the ladder of Jacob's vision, representing Christ, who has connected earth with heaven, and finite man with infinite God. So there you have it. What's the representation? It's Jesus Christ, right? Because he's the mediator, the go-between. He's the one that when we broke our connection with God, he's the one that's rebuilding that connection for us, right? So that's what that ladder is representing. It's representing earth and heaven being connected by Christ, Christ being the ladder. Okay. So, the lesson study uh, just basically explains, uh, which I, like I, I mentioned, I'm trying to get to Friday, but I don't want to miss anything important. If somebody's found something that they want to talk about, feel free to, to uh, raise your hand. Um, but let me see what, I can, what else I can glean from this lesson here. Um, the voice goes on to repeat promises. Jacob is familiar with from the family lore. Your offspring will become great. They will be a blessing to all families of the earth. Know that I go for, or excuse me, I am with you. The voice, is continue, the voice continues. And I will keep you wherever you go, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So number one, we know that Jacob had done, we know the main sin that he had done, which was being deceitful and lying to his brother and getting the blessing, right? And so he's done these things. And they're not things that God approves of, but yet we see God in his grace still blessing him, right? And that's really the lesson that's for us today is that even though we're in our sins, which we all are, God is still, because of his grace, he's still there. He's still willing to bless us and give us the blessings that we need, that he offers us. Um, and of course, the blessings we know that he gives Jacob, he promises what he promised his father, the same blessing. And he also tells him that this very land that you're standing on is going to be your, your inheritance through your people. But he's also telling him the same thing he told Adam and, me, Adam and Eve, that through his descendants is going to come the Messiah. Okay? So, um, Ellen G. White wrote, I read that already, the latter. Uh, the last line reads, Jacob awakens and he says to himself, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Because once again, you know, the guilt and the shame of sin, sometimes we feel separated from God. Especially immediately after we sin, we, I, I've been there. How can I go here now and be with God when I was just over here? But, you know, we just have to remember what a, what a gracious God he is. That, that his grace is bigger than any sin. You know, the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Right? Any comments? Okay, um, I'm just going to read the bottom here because I always like the questions asked. What can we learn from the story about how God in Christ is seeking to reach us despite our sins? Again, why must Christian education keep this principle at the forefront of what it teaches? And if somebody wants to comment, feel free. We don't necessarily have a comment. Just one comment, if I may ask somebody else something. You know, the great thing about this is this story, and it, it is a good part of Christian education. I know being on the chairman of the board of the academy is sometimes we have issues with young people, 
uh, that, that we have to sometimes discipline or whatever. But that Jacob was a deceiver. He deceived his father. He did harm to his brother. Uh, you know, he did about anything he could think of. That's why he was running away and so forth. Uh, the fact that God stayed with him. And I think sometimes even the, the most dangerous thing is, is that when we do something and we know we shouldn't have done it and so forth, there's a, there's a process for that to go to, to go to go to God and confess our sin. But he doesn't leave us even though we haven't uh, and so forth. He stays with us and encourages us. And, uh, and I think the thing is, is that, you know, he promised in his words that Abraham promised the land of Canaan and he includes Jacob in that. Mm hmm. Right? Yes. And so forth. And it's interesting, Jacob recognized this was God talking and so forth. That he's, he's blessing me, even in the midst. He acknowledged that. And this is what's interesting to me, because some people say, well, he's bargaining with God. If you do this, I'll do this. That's what he says. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And, and so forth. But you know, when I think about that, why are we Christians to begin with? It isn't necessarily because we love God. Love's a process. It's because of the fact we acknowledge our sin, because we see that he's right. We have a, everybody has a measure of faith. But I think number two is is that um, we, when God gives us, what's the first thing he gives us? He gives us forgiveness. He gives us salvation. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us the right to become children of God. He gives us all of those things up front, not later. Mm -hmm. And so we said, because he's done this for me, I want to do this for him. Isn't that a natural thing? We have? And so forth. So I think the fact is, is that we are Christians today because there's benefit in being a Christian. Anybody disagree with that, I wonder? I wouldn't be here if there wasn't. <laughs> yeah, that's true. What did Paul say when they said there's no resurrection? Some people say, well, you know, uh, if I just lived the Christian life and there was no resurrection, I'd be happy. Paul says, I beg to differ. He said, if... There is no resurrection. We ought to be pitied above all men. Mm -hmm. We're living a lie. Enough said. Yeah, thanks. I liked your comments, brother. Thank you. Um, okay. So if there's no other comments, let's, uh, let's move on to Tuesday's lesson. Uh, and the, the title is uh, Rabbi Jesus. Uh, Rabbi, we know, is teacher. But rabbi also connotates master. So when they call somebody rabbi, it means master. Of course, Jesus said, call nobody master, right? That's right. But they did a lot of things that they shouldn't have been doing anyway. Uh, so, Rabbi Jesus. Um, in the New Testament, there is none more famous. You know, I, I found that kind of interesting. You know, it says, uh, of all the chapters beginning in the New Testament, none is more famous than this. Um, and I say arguably because, you know, some people think we, we had a, uh, sermon one day and, uh, I think it was Pastor Jay. He asked, uh, what would you say the number one scripture is in all of the Bible? <laughs> and of course, the one that most people think is in the New Testament also. And that would be, uh, and what's, what's, what would somebody say is the number one most recognized scripture? John 3.16. That's right, right? For God so loved the world. Um, but here it's saying that, uh, which is one of my favorites, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you know, that's so fascinating when you think of that, because what it's doing is, when you think of the wording, it says, in the beginning. Right? What other chapter starts in the beginning? Or, excuse me, not chapter, excuse me. Uh, yeah, we'll say chapter. What other book starts in the beginning? Excuse me? That's right. Genesis 1, right? So this is linking creation with Jesus Christ, isn't it? It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So what happened in the beginning? Creation, right? So Jesus created us? Yes. Because remember, it goes on to say that He made everything, and everything that was made, there was nothing that was made that wasn't made by Him. So Jesus made everything, which means you and I, right? and everything that's in the world, and anything that exists, right? So he was in the beginning with the Father. He created us. He created all things. Um, so it says, uh, and John 1 soon takes you to the unforgettable verse, and the Word became flesh 
and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Um, and I and I really like that uh, because what I'm going to talk about here in just a minute is uh, the grace and truth part. The grace and truth. You know what does that mean? Grace and truth. Okay, so don't answer yet. Uh, I'll ask the question again in just a moment. So we're going to go on and we're going to look at John one, uh, one through fourteen. Um, and the question is asking is, uh, what are they sharing about who Jesus was and what he was doing here? What he was and what he was doing here. And then also, what should this tell us about Jesus as a great example of a teacher? So, number one, it's telling us that Jesus is God in the flesh, right? That's who Jesus is. What did he really come for? And I know that's kind of a big question also because there's a lot of things that he came for. Uh, which, by the way, uh, I remember reading that he came at the worst time in history with as far as God's people was concerned. And the reason is, is because, of course, I always like to say that they had turned everything upside down concerning God and who God was. So Jesus had to come and reveal the character of who God was, who he was. And so Jesus comes and he turns everything right side up. Of course, they hated him because of that, because it was contrary to everything they taught, right? Um, so, um, I'm going to read a little bit from the lesson, and I'm going to go back to the question again about grace and truth, because I believe that's what we're looking at here, the grace and truth part. Um, so, the lesson study tells us that the same God who spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden uh, and to Jacob in the middle of nowhere now shows up as a person. God says the New Testament was personified in Jesus. Through Jesus, we can learn about God's will and God's way because Jesus was God. Um, okay, so we know what grace is, right? Or we should, you know, uh, and a lot of times people will just say the meaning of the word, which is unmerited favor. But it doesn't really tell us really a whole lot of what we re really need to know about what grace is. So in a nutshell, of course, grace, the Bible says, Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death, right? So we all have a death sentence, okay? We all have a death sentence. But because of grace, the unmerited favor, we end up getting what what we, we, we end up not getting what we deserve, in other words. We end up not getting what we deserve. In other words, we don't get the penalty of death because Jesus, Jesus Christ has offered us a way out. How has he offered us that way out? What is the way out that he gives us? And of course, it's a plan of salvation, but what is that way out that he gives us? I have a mic here, so if you, I don't mind getting up and giving it. The, the, the thing, and I'm going to say the thing, is his blood. It's the blood that atones for our sins, isn't it? So the grace is Jesus giving up his life for us because we deserve death. So instead, we get the grace, which means that we don't have to die because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Um... Grace and truth, that's yeah. what I said I wanted to talk about because John 1.14 says grace and truth, okay? So we talked a little bit about the grace there. Now I want to talk about the truth. And this gets a little tricky because, remember, even in Jesus' time when he was before Pilate, he said, what is truth? And that's a big question, what is truth? But I'm going to break it down a little bit. And feel free to disagree with me if you'd like. I'm just going to share a few things with you. Um, turn to John 17, uh, or excuse me, John 1, 17, because we're looking at John 1, right? And I want somebody, if they would, to read John 1, 17 for me. And hopefully I have a taker, but if I don't, I'll go ahead and read it. Okay, go ahead. He'll give you the mic in just a second. I'll hold it for you. Um... 
John 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through, through Jesus Christ. Okay, so we heard grace and truth there, right? Again, what exactly is John saying there? What exactly is he saying? He says, Moses gave us the law, but Jesus gave us... What he's saying is, how many people would agree that the law is truth? I'll tell you, number one, the word is truth. The whole Bible is truth right. because it's a representation of Jesus Christ. Right. What is the law a representation of? The Ten Commandments. What's that a representation of? Yeah, go ahead, bro. Yeah, you know, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, not in, in that context, but mm -hmm. with regard to the fact that they were trying to decide, you know, what was the father like? Yes. And Jesus had told Philip, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And then he went on to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father by me. Jesus is the truth. Yeah. Grace is an attribute of love. And in the Pharisees' view of religion, the law was the ultimate. Okay? And it was given to a man. But Moses could give love. Okay? It was the law written, but not the law in spirit. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus gives love. He gives substance to the law. He gives motivation to the law. Uh, and so forth. So Moses could give the law that was given to him by Jesus. He couldn't give love. And that's what Jesus does, and that's so. God so loved the world. And so that is the primary attribute, and grace is one of those. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, that's exactly what's being said, is, is he's saying, you know, Moses gave the law, but is there any power in the law to do anything? None. No. All it does is reveal our sin. So we need the solution to the sin problem. And what he's saying there is, Jesus is that solution because Jesus not only brought truth, but he also brought grace. But once again, like I said, the truth there. Uh, Ellen G. White says that the law is a transcript of his own character and is a standard of all character. That's right. Jesus said, I am the truth, right? Mm -hmm. um, so rather than just bringing us the truth, the law, Jesus also brought us grace, right? Uh, so Jesus, instead of simply just showing us the law and saying, here you go, I'm done, right? He says, well, I'm also going to show you the answer to that. Um, so he brings us grace. Uh, so instead of Jesus just saying, you know, yeah, I know you're broken. He also says, I give you a way to fix that. And I think that's, that's just, that's the whole summary of the gospel message. You know, it's the plan of salvation, right? Because what good is it otherwise if we don't have a way to fix it? Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to share something because uh, what I'm saying here is that the law is truth, okay? That's what we're talking about here, truth and grace. Uh, and I, like I said, if anybody wants to argue that point, feel free. Uh, but I'm going to share something. Uh, does, can somebody tell me what Moses' first miracle was? I'll give you a clue found in Exodus. <laughs> what was it? No, that wasn't it. It was, remember, when he turned the water to blood. Okay? Water turning to blood was a representation of judgment. Okay? And keep that in mind because you're going you're gonna to see how interesting this is, how it turns out. But what was Jesus' first miracle? The wedding of Cana. Yeah. And what happened there? He turned the water to wine. Wine is a representation of blood, right? Yeah, it is. So what's going on here? That was a gift, a great gift. It was a gift of grace that Jesus was representing that he was giving when he did that miracle. Okay. And think about it also. When he was on the cross, what came out of his side? It was water and blood. So what you're looking at is judgment, or we could say law or truth, and grace. That's what we're looking at. 
And so that's what we're talking about here when we talk about grace and truth. It's talking about the truth being the fact that we're sinners and God gave us his character in his Ten Commandments, and then he gives us a solution, which is the grace. Does that make sense? Comment, brother. Can you help him out with the mic there, brother? Thank you for the question, and uh, it's a little bit difficult to understand what truth and the grace is all about. Yes. The truth is that our sin drove Jesus Christ to the cross. And God loves us in the sense that he sent his son to take up the punishment we deserve on the cross. That is where grace comes in. God still loves us to the point that he took his son and he put him to the cross so that he could take the punishment we deserve. None of us could save us as we are here because we are defiled by our sinful nature. That is where it comes to that truth and grace. It comes from God only. It's God who is so gracious to us that he accepted to take his son and they sent him to the cross just for our sins, for you and me, so that we can be saved forever. Amen. Thank you, brother. Um, so the lesson goes on to say, I'm going to move down to the middle of the lesson. It says, the next day he saw Jesus, John the Baptist, and declared that he was the Son of God. That day and also the day later, he called Jesus the Lamb of God. Uh, interestingly enough, if you look closely at, at that, he actually calls him the Lamb of God first in verse 29. And then he calls him in verse 34, the Son of God. And then in verse 36, he calls him the Lamb of God again. Um, also, two of John the Baptist's followers decided to follow Jesus themselves. You know, once they heard and they saw Jesus, uh, they end up, it was Andrew and, John and Andrew are the first two that end up following Jesus. And so, they, uh, and Jesus asked them, what are you looking for, right? What are you looking for? Uh, and they call him rabbi. And as I mentioned earlier, rabbi means teacher or master. Uh, so then Jesus is a rabbi, a teacher, but never has been a human teacher like him because, again, he is God. What better teacher can you go to? You know, oftentimes we often go to people outside of the Bible, which I know, I understand, it's okay, but... What greater teacher do we have than God himself, who knows everything? And God gives us everything that we need to know concerning salvation and how to live on this earth. It's all there in the Bible, every bit. Whatever the topic is that you need to learn about in life, you'll find it in the Bible. So it's kind of interesting that we often go outside of the Bible for help when all the answers are really, truly there. But maybe at times, you know, we just can't find them that easy. Um, so in other words, God came down to hum uh, humanity in the form of a human being. And in that form, he functioned as a rabbi, a teacher. No wonder Ellen G. White calls him the greatest teacher the world has ever seen. Okay, um, I'm just going to read the bottom. And then if we have any comments, feel free to comment. Considering who Jesus was, why does it make sense to learn from him? The best ways of teaching spiritual truth. What can we learn from Jesus about why not only what we say is important for teaching, but also what we do? Um, yeah, uh, we can talk about it all day long, but if we're not actually applying it, then it doesn't do us any good. Any comments? Okay. The process of when Jesus tells us what to do, the question is, is, and the theological issue is, how to do it. And approaching that wrong leads us into a situation of the scribes and the Pharisees. They were doers of the word. I mean, they would say, Paul said that. He said, when it comes to living in the flesh, I've made it, man. 
You're looking at the, you're looking at the guy, right? Did he say that? Mm -hmm. And I would say if we would have looked at Paul's life before his conversion, we'd say, wow, this guy's impressive. He does everything right, right? You know what Paul said about that kind of experience? He said, it's like garbage to me right now. It doesn't mean a thing. Mm -hmm. So the question goes back to the old idea that how do I perform? How do I do what God asks me to do? And he goes back to John 6, 28, 29. Master, what work can we do that we can do the works of God? Two kinds of works. Jesus said, the work I'm going to ask you to do as a Christian is to know the one who the Father has sent. Now, says that in John 6. Stay connected and I will help you, and I will, through me, you will bear fruit. That's a promise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen, I like that. Uh, I believe the same thing, you know. Uh, we might fall from day to day away, but as long as we're connected, because the Bible tells us that, again, back to John, John 15, right? Talks about the vine, this marvelous vine. You know, as long as we're connected to that vine, which means daily reading, prayer, being close, yep. connection, connected to that vine, we'll be okay, you know, because we often doubt ourselves that, uh, you know, we've sinned so much, we're so far, but God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. It's us that leaves him, and the way we leave him is by falling away from what we should be doing every day, being connected to that vine. Okay, uh, see how much we can cover on Wednesdays. Uh, we're looking at the story of the Canaanite woman, a uh, Syrophoenician woman, she was basically a mix of, uh, of uh, Phoenician and, uh, uh, oh, what's the other one? Come on. Uh, anyway, uh, so we're looking at uh, Matthew 15, 21 through 28 talks about the story, and also Mark in 7, 24 through 30 mentions the same story. The encounter with the Canaanite woman from Tyre and Sidon. Jesus had went to get away. In Mark's gospel, it says that, he was trying to get away from the people and everything and trying to find a place of solitude maybe or just to be away from everybody. And uh, of course in the story, we know that uh, this woman comes up to him and she's not only a woman, but she's also a Gentile. And Jesus mentions, let's just take a look at it just briefly. Um, and I'm just going to read it through it just for the sake of time. It says, Behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Now notice, first of all, she's calling him son of David. So what does that kind of signify? That she believes he's the Messiah. And he answered her not a word, verse 23 says. So... Imagine she's crying out and she's just being ignored. And his disciples came and said, send her away. She cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, when Jesus came, and I like this because this is an example for us too. Uh, you know, oftentimes as Christians, we kind of neglect the family and we go out and we want to minister and preach to everybody else. Meanwhile, our, our home is suffering. Jesus came to his first. He didn't go to the Gentiles first. That was Paul's mission, right? So Jesus is ignoring her and he tells her, um, you know, that he was sent to the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him. Notice, came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered her. Fortunately, she gets a response now, meaning that he's not ignoring her. And uh, he said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Uh, there's a lot of ways that people have viewed this story and interpreted it. But we're going to look at it and figure out quickly, before we run out of time, what really is going on in this narrative. So we see Jesus calling somebody. Notice it's not a big dog, right? Another thing I kind of thought was interesting that this woman is from Canaan. Uh, I, I won't go there. But so he says, little dog. Uh, back during that time, they would have, see, Jews would not have animals or dogs as pets, but Gentiles would. Uh, and when they had a pet, it was usually a little tiny, like, lap dog. And of course, 
they're eating off the crumbs of the table, well, the dogs. And so Jesus tells her, he says, uh, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Well, number one, notice, there must be an abundance of food on the table in order for crumbs to fall to the ground, right? So she says, hey, you know, she, she's like calling him out. You know, the lesson, uh, the, the heading is a woman talks back. So here the, the woman is saying that even the little dogs get what falls from the table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, oh, woman, great is your faith. Notice he doesn't say that in Mark, though. He only says it in Matthew, great is your faith, because Mark doesn't even acknowledge that. He says, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. So number one, I want to say, was Jesus being disrespectful in calling her a little dog? Or what was really going on here? Because there's a, there's a, a, a lesson to be learned here. And I believe, some believe that the lesson was for the disciples. It wasn't really for the woman because Jesus said her faith was great, right? So what's really going on with this story? I want to see if I can get a comment, and then I can make a comment right in closing. And if not, I can just go ahead and, because uh, we're getting close, I can finish it up. So was Jesus insulting her? Go ahead, our brother back there again. I don't mean to point. I apologize, but we've got to see what's going on. Sorry for coming back to the same question. I, uh, you mentioned that Jesus um, taught more than he preached, if I can summarize that, which is true. He, he taught a lot more than he preached. But I have a, a small little question. Maybe I might be mistaken. Jesus Christ actually, for what reason, he taught too much. He taught his disciples, and the main subject he taught about was the kingdom of God. And I'm asking myself why Jesus Christ was the Son of God, who was able to do things to teach, preach, and baptize. Why didn't he baptize more than he taught or preached? But as we, as we are here in the church, we say that we needed to bring many souls to Christ through baptism. Why did Jesus? Why didn't Jesus baptize people? Maybe I might be mistaken. Has why didn't, he baptized? Why didn't he, can you repeat that? Why didn't he? Why didn't he baptize people? Oh, Jesus. Why? Okay, good question. It's a really good question. Any takers on that? Right, right. Yeah, it's a good question. I wish I had a good answer for you, but I don't currently. But I'm going to look at that for sure. And maybe next week uh, or the week after, we can answer that question. Um, but I need to close because uh, the bell already rang and we're close to the, the end here. But this is one of the best stories and one of the greatest stories that I've always loved because here we see, as I mentioned, it really was truly a lesson about faith because the disciples at this point, they weren't where they needed to be in their spiritual walk. You know, we go on in Thursday's lesson about spiritual blindness and physical blindness with Bartimaeus. Well, the disciples at that point were still spiritually blind in many ways. And so Jesus shows them a lesson about a woman who wasn't spiritually blind, who believed who he was and had enough faith that she asked him, even after being seemingly insulted. And I just love the way she throws that back. And Jesus knew what she was going to say, right? So what he's really doing is he's calling her out. And for an example, not only for the disciples, but for us too today, right? And it's a, it's a lesson on faith. Okay, so I'm going to end on that note, and I'm just going to have a word of prayer for us in closing. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the time spent this morning in fellowship, in fellowship with you, Father, and with each other. And uh, I just want to pray that as we leave here today, that these lessons we would go back and further research father for our own selves to be able to have uh, the clear understanding of the lessons that you teach us from day to day you are the master teacher lord jesus and uh we just thank you and we just ask that you continue 
uh, teaching us that we might grow and that we might be able to receive your truth and grace, Father. Uh, thank you for giving us our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray that today as we go into the rest of the services, that our speakers will be blessed and that our whole uh, lessons today will be about you. And I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.